First John chapter 3 is where we're at. Last week, recall that we covered Christ, our advocate, right? Our defense attorney. It's a really good analogy, I think. That's back from uh, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1. Today I want to look at a couple of topics, and it's going to be kind of a hobby horse kind of thing. I'm sorry. I haven't jumped on the horse in a while, though, but we're back at it, and I think for good reason. I want to look at uh, a couple of topics. Just like I said, let's first look at verse 9, and I want to look at the topic of how to take the Bible out of context, okay? Which is not what Christians are supposed to do, take the Bible out of context. You should never base a doctrine around pulling one verse out of a chapter without considering the rest of the chapter, right? That would be malpractice, a recipe to establish poor doctrine. Look at verse 9. It says, 3-9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. If you just take that verse, isolate it by itself, you could, you could work to a conclusion that says a Christian is incapable of sinning. Christians cannot sin. Christians reach sinless perfection. Christians reach a point where they just stop sinning altogether. Some people actually hold that belief. Do you know that? That Christians reach this sinless perfection point, or Christians don't sin at all, or Christians don't sin, it's just... um. Um, they're outward man sinning, not really them. They work around it because instead of just reading the full context and understanding what it's saying, they isolate the verse. This is a problem. You see, with every cult you see out there, every strange doctrine you see out there, you'll find this practice. And as you talk to them, you say, oh, wait, 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 that's the verse you're taking completely out of context, right? Whether someone thinking that, you know, water baptism saves you, or that, wow, you're really taking that out of context. You know, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, pulling one passage out of that conversation. This happens. We are to rightly divide the word of truth, and rightly dividing begins with the chapter itself. So we'll look at that. After you match a verse with the context, then you match the context of the chapter with the context of the Bible, okay? And then you decide, is this what it's really saying or not? Let's look at this chapter and see what that verse really means. Look at verse 1, please. Verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Is a really good things in both verses. I would like to bring out the following. Christians are locked in. We have eternal life. We are now called the children of God. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you become a child of God. You have an inheritance incorruptible. You can never lose that relationship with the Father. As a child of God, your, your future is sealed, right? Eternal security is real. Keep that in mind as we go, okay? So already Christians are saved and they're locked in forever as a child of God. It says that. The world then doesn't recognize this. Verse 1 says, because it knew him not. Now they don't recognize us either. It says there also, it says, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We have a new identity as a child of God. And in our future, we'll be able to see him as he is. God as he is. That's a big deal. This idea that now sinful man will one day be able to see God as he is. That is not possible in our sinful state. Realize that? Remember with uh, Moses? And Moses wanted to see God. And in Exodus 33, 20, uh, God said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. In our sinful state, we cannot see God. But as children of God, one day we will. In our glorified bodies, we will. Big deal, okay? Verse 1 and 2 just simply setting the stage that Christians are different. Different forever. Look at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Verse 3 is important. If you are a child of God... 
you are to do the continual acts of purifying yourself. Okay? Now, this is not talking about salvation right there. To purify yourself is to make pure or clear. The definition is to free from extraneous admixture. Right? Like you say, you'd purify a metal, right? Um, purify, get things out of the metal, make it a pure metal. Christians are called as children of God to purify themselves. This is the context so far, okay? And purifying is a continual process. As the world wants to mix things in our lives, things of darkness, things of sin, Christians are working to get, expel those things and remain pure, okay? Not for salvation, but because as He is holy, we are to be holy. Look at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Four includes an important word, and the word is committeth. Committeth. Committeth, we'll see today, it's used 17 times in the Bible. It always indicates a continual practice. Committeth. A continual practice, okay? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law. This continual practice of living in sin, you are living contrary to the law. Read on, five. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, but whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Look at verse six. It adds another important word. This word abideth. Abideth is like that word. It's a continual state. You stay somewhere. To abide in God is to abide in His words. Obey His Bible. Okay? There in verse 6. Uh, it says, Abideth in Him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither know Him. When you, when you abide in obedience to God, you will not be in sin. Right? If you abide in compliance with the Word of God, you will not be in sin. This is the idea of staying pure, staying on God's path, right? We're in the weeds, I understand a little bit, but I think we need to understand this because this can be taken out of context. Look at verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Again, the word doeth. Doesn't say that he hath done, right? He that doeth, it's a continual action. It's like the word committeth. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Continual actions, these are called lifestyles, right? These are called habits. Are your habits in life habits of sin or habits of righteousness? Habits of good things. A Christian is supposed to have habits of good things, of righteousness, not habits of sin. 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. If you are someone that committeth sin, that means stay in a lifestyle of sin. And I'll show you some examples here in a second. But if you remain in sin... It's then clear, it's manifest that you are of the devil, not of the children of God. Not of God. Does that make sense? We covered this, I think, in our sermon last week, so forgive the repetition. But this is what this chapter is saying, okay? I know some of you think you've reached sinless perfection, uh, but it's just not true. We have the context also of the chapter before, do we not? Talking about if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Christians continue to sin. It would be foolish to say it doesn't exist, because if you say that, you're not going to be checking yourself and trying to stay pure, right? It would also be foolish to say it's okay to sin, because chapter 2 tells us not to, and this explains not to, okay? He that committeth sin, verse 8, is of the devil. To the broader point, and to the point last week, if you see somebody living in a lifestyle of sin, it's simply evidence that that person is not of God. Their father is the devil, according to the word of God. They don't know the Savior. Look here at verse 9. Here, back to our point. And having understood all that context, so far, what's it talking about? Committeth, right? Doeth, abideth. All these words are continual actions. 
How are you living? Now watch verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Verse 9 is a comment to verse 7 and verse 6. Verse 9 is saying, if you are born of God, you will not be living in sin, right? You won't see it. Whosoever born of God doth not sin. So if we see somebody living in a lifestyle of sin as a, a fornicator, a, a drunk, an adulterer, a, a homosexual, living in sin, we can identify whether or not they're born of God. Verse 9 is telling us this. If you're a child of God, you have this seed in you, this Holy Spirit within you that is going to compel you to live purely, convict you to get away from sin, to eschew evil. A true Christian has this. A true Christian has a Heavenly Father that chastises when we fall into sin. There is no way a Christian can remain in sin. There's no way. The conviction will become so great that they stop, or the punishment will become so severe that they stop. Right? When they do not stop, it's evidence, and when something does not stop them, it's evidence that they are not born again. And this is a sobering topic because if you think in your life, especially those of you who grew up in Christian circles, right? And you had all kinds of youth group around you who were professing what you were professing, but now... 15, 20 years later, 30 years later, you understand they're living a lifestyle of sin. Well, this is the context from the Bible that would compel us to preach that they don't know the Lord. Because if you have Christ in you, you won't be living in these lifestyles of sin. Make sense? Look at verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest. That's a key word too. Think about verse 9 and then think about verse 10 and that word manifest. That means what we see, right? When we see someone's lifestyle, it's manifest to us whether they are a Christian or not. God already knows, right? It's just like fruit inspection. You, when we judge someone by their fruits, that's for us, because God already knows the heart. So when it says, verse 9, in this the children of God will manifest, it's saying, excuse me, verse 10, it's saying verse 9 is telling us that when you see people committing these lifestyle sins, you then, it's manifest to your eyes that they are the children of the devil, it says in verse 10. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. By the way, look at the end of verse 10. We can also discern... It's the word I would use, and the world would say, oh, you're being so judgmental, and you're picking on people, saying everybody's not saved. Well, you see this concept a lot in Scripture, and it's important, but also not just sin can we discern someone's state with God. It also says, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. If you see a person who, okay, they're not living in sodomy or adultery, they're not, okay? But you look at their whole life, and they're not doing any works of righteousness? then you judge them by those works. I mean, how can you live your Christian life and, and never be about sharing the gospel? How can that be, friend? How can you live your Christian life and never put your back to the work of a local church? How can that be, friend, right? How can you live your Christian life and, sorry, your, your, your Bible is gathering dust? How can that be, friend? We can challenge people in this way, and we should. The Bible does. If you read this chapter in context, you understand it preaches quite a message to the lost, doesn't it? Quite a message to the lost. Neither he that loveth not his brother. In 1 John, you see him, he'll point this flashlight at brethren. And in the, in the verses to come, 11 all the way into chapter 4, you'll see that John preaches a sermon of you can tell somebody being saved or not by how they, te how they treat fellow sons and daughters of God, the children of God, right? He makes the point here, neither he that loveth not his brother. If you find Christians who do not love true Christians, you again have cause to say maybe this person's not a Christian. The love of the brothers should be part of who they are. Does this make sense? I tried to move through. You see what I mean? If you just take verse 9, it could, be, it could cause confusion. You understand, right? 
So we read the whole context. And there is enough evidence in this chapter alone to say that Christians don't stop sinning. It's talking about lifestyle, right? And if that wasn't enough, you compare this chapter to everything else you see in the Word of God, which will not teach this lesson that Christians stop sinning. It will teach us all these lessons of Christians are supposed to desire to stop sinning, strive to stop sinning, but it's an ongoing battle with the flesh that never ends. And if you have a, a question about it, look to the great Apostle Paul, right? who his proclamation was, O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? If Paul wasn't able to kick the habit all the way, kick sin all the way, then friends, we're not either. No, no sinful man in a sinful body can. You would probably be surprised, and you may think I'm, I'm, I'm beating a straw man, but actually this belief is out there. It's in a lot of uh, Pentecostal movements, holiness kind of movements, there's a gentleman right next door um, that believes, and he was trying to convince me, no, we don't sin anymore. I don't sin anymore. I'm a Christian. I'm done. I'm done sinning. And my words to him were, well, you've, you've surpassed the great apostle Paul. <laughs> Sorry. You need to teach him the lesson when you see him in heaven. You didn't kick it, did you? Yeah. It's out there. We won't fall into that trap because I think it really could be damning. I think then you, you live your life in a cavalier way, not eschewing evil. Let's plug in some examples. And for that, I'm going to jump on the horse that I've ridden before a few times. But I want to go to that word committeth because it's used 17 times. And I want to tell you, let's look at some of these times and it'll teach a lesson. Look at John 8, 34. John 8, 34. I, I may stop because I, as far as in 1 John and come back to the rest of 1 John 3 next week. John 8, 34. Sometimes I like to do a study where you, you look at a word and you see how is it used in Scripture. And, and what that's doing is really helping you discern context, right? What is the word committeth? What does it mean? So only use 17 times. So it's a kind of unique word for a specific purpose. Look at 8, 34. And the definitions, if you look up committeth, which is an older word now, the definitions are continually practices. That's the definition. 834 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. He, that relates really closely to what First John's talking about, isn't it? You know yourself, you know others by their fruits. When someone committeth sin in that continual state of sin, they are a servant of that sin. They're not a servant of God. Cannot be. Cannot be. Look at, well, let me read this one to you. Save us some time. Ezekiel 33, 18 says this. Ezekiel 33, 18 says, When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. Yeah, it's Ezekiel 33, 18. I thought it was interesting. But remember what I said about a, a, a believer when they go into sin, there's only two ways out, right? They're either convicted and they get it right, or sadly, God eventually takes them home. I mean, he's merciful, yeah, I'm sure he works with them, I'm sure. He tries to convince them with some woodshed, I'm sure. But this passage speaks right to the point. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, right? When you turn from the way of truth and you jump into a lifestyle of sin and you stay there, and it says, he shall even die thereby. Ain't nobody preaching that anymore. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Uh, right? The world doesn't sound right. It's the Bible. You can see it in other, other passages. Christian jumps out of the way of truth, jumps into a lifestyle of sin. Their whole life then is one destructive force. Their whole life then is one um, double message to the world. Oh, wait, that's a Christian, but they're living ungodly. What in the world? Right? God stops that life. Because it's so destructive, it destroys everyone around them. You won't find, then, a lot of Christians living in a lifestyle of sin. They'll either be getting right tomorrow, or God will be remedying the situation. Let's look at this, and let's look at an example. And here's where um, I think the example will help. You know where you see the word committeth, quite often in those 17 times, is on the topic of adultery. Right? The topic of adultery. This is important. You say, Logan, it's a horse you ride a lot. Well, it's because people commit the sin a lot. And churches preach it wrong a lot. And I've got to keep preaching it, friends. 
I got to keep preaching it. It'll, it'll, be a, it'll be an important point from now until Christ comes back. It's the sin of our day. It really is preceding sodomy. So is divorce and remarriage a one-time sin or a continual sin? I ask the question openly. How about this? Is the sin of divorce and remarriage a forgivable sin of the past or is it a continual sin of the present? That's what, you, that's what we've got to ask. Ask. Is divorce and remarriage, and we'll look at the scriptures, but is divorce and remarriage, which is sanctioned by every church today practically, sanctioned by every church, but is it a sin hated by Almighty God? Big difference there. I, I want to preface some of these verses with this thought so you know who you're working with. Every church in this valley, every church in this valley says that divorce and remarriage is a one-time sin. So there are other options. I told a couple the other day. There are other options. You can go get a second opinion. Okay? But the Bible is the opinion that should stand. The Ruckmanite Church right up the street, the Ruckmanite Baptist Church right up the street, um, would say it's a one-time sin. In fact, they have to because their founder, Peter Ruckman, was married three times. Right? Three times. So let's look at whether that is right or wrong. Please look at Mark 10, and I'll go a few other places. It won't be a long study, but friends, if there's an example of the word committeth, uh, it's this topic. Mark 10. Mark 10. This topic really, I'm afraid, separates the... That's stupid phrasing, but the men from the boys in Christianity. Those who take the Bible seriously and those who don't. Let's look at this. Mark 10. We can start about verse 2. 10 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, did, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. This means there's a rule from Genesis about marriage, okay? And we see that in other passages. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, and they are no more twain, but one flesh. This means there's a rule in Genesis that precedes anything Moses ever wrote to those hard-hearted people, right? There's a universal rule in Genesis, and it's this. They twain shall be one flesh, and they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay? Very clear. Right? They're asking about divorce. Is there such a thing? Does it break a marriage? God says no. It says there's two. They're never again. Um, two become one. They're never again twain. He says, let not man put asunder. And in the house, his disciples, verse 10, asked them again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another. Now read it with me in your King James Bible, which the Ruckmanites preach from. Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committed adultery that one time at the altar. Is that what your version says? No. The Bible says, and I believe in the King James Bible, is preserved, the preserved Word of God, not doubled inspired as some doofuses think, but the preserved Word of God committeth adultery. Committeth is a continual state. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Friends, that means this is a continual sin, not a one-time sin. Friends, this has ramifications for our topic this morning. How then can a Christian stay in a continual state of sin, understanding that 1 John 3 is true? It brings two things to bear. One, they need to get right if they're truly saved. They need to get right on this, which means hard preaching needs to come across. Hard conversations need to be had, which aren't happening in these ungodly churches. The loving thing is to say, friend, you cannot stay in your sin. The unloving thing is to say, you're going to be okay, it's all forgiven. No, it's committing something. It's continual, committeth. The only other thing that will happen will be God's judgment. I believe the Bible is true. Let's think about this. 
uh, just let me just define one thing for you. Remember what, why, this is, con why is this um, continual adultery, friends? Why is marrying, changing your spouse and marrying somebody else, why is it continual adultery? And in Baptist churches, this happens all the time. In fact, with Peter Ruckman, you could have me, let's say I am uh, the man, I could leave my wife and I could marry, uh, heaven forbid, let's say just some other lady in the church, okay? Well, according to this doctrine, God forgives, it's okay. God forgives. It's all done. It's all under the blood, right? Logically, that could be the conclusion. Would anybody really think that's true? No, it's not true. And in fact, what would be happening, and now our minds are going to bad places, but now what's happening is we are defrauding the marriage bed every time we commit relations, every time we have relations. That's what it says in, in John 8, 4, the woman was taken in adultery in the very act. You say, Logan, what is this? What do you mean a continual sin. Well, every time you have relations with somebody who's not your wife, you are committing adultery. Think about it in the context of your marriage right now. If I went down the street and had relations with somebody, it would be committing adultery, right? Okay. Well, how about this? What if I booted Emma out the door and brought that lady inside my home? Then is it not anymore committing adultery? It's still committing adultery, okay? How about this? What if I boot Emma out, bring that lady in my home, have a judge sign a piece of paper? Then am I not committing adultery anymore? No, this passage says the exact opposite. For the hardness of your heart, that precept came about. Of Moses, not of God. God contradicts it. Moses did it just to control an unruly, wicked people. God didn't implement it. He says, he says what they are God to join together, let not man put asunder. Does this make sense? Adultery is the marriage bed. Stealing the marriage bed is being a thief, just like a thief. In fact, that's what it says in Psalm 50, 18. It equates the two. When thou sawest a thief, thou, then thou consentest with him and hast been partaker with adulterers. These churches today that are sanctioning and saying, you're okay, keep stealing, keep stealing, keep stealing. It's just like saying, yeah, you just robbed from Albertsons, you're welcome, thou to the joy of the Lord. You stole yesterday, you stole the week before, welcome on in. You're a member in good standing in our church. Oh, your pastor who's stealing from Albertsons, welcome on in the joy of the Lord. God forgives it all. You're still stealing something that's not yours. Living in sin. By the way, Peter Ruckman, who lived in sin for his entire then adult life, I take it to mean, because I never saw him slapped down by God's almighty righteous hand, I take it to mean Peter Ruckman was never saved to begin with. A complete false preacher in our age that many follow, and sadly many people who have other things right get this way wrong including the church right up the street. Look at this, Romans 7, 3. And friends, we're, we're out of time, but I'm going to get right to the end of it right here. Sometimes I apologize to you because I know I've, we've preached this concept with you many times. But friends, the world doesn't know this at all. And if 1 John 3 is true, they are living in a very dangerous place, living in sin. In our church, and you, friend, as a Christian who loves people, should not go around telling people that their sin is okay. Their sin is okay. Romans 7, 3 is what we'll read. But let's think about some of the counter-arguments. The, you know the counter-arguments I get on these? It's never over Scripture. When I talk to somebody about this concept, in fact, the last two times I've counseled people who have this situation in their lives, both of them said, well, we can't argue with the Word of God. What you say is true. There's no, there's no excuse according to the Word of God. But you know what they'll say? Or others will say, well, don't they deserve to be happy? Don't these people deserve to be happy? I'm sorry. It, there's, it's, it's a slippery slope. It's a, no, it's just a terrible argument. Deserving to be happy? Or they'll also say, doesn't God forgive? Doesn't God forgive? Well, friends, by that logic, should we stop preaching against homosexual marriage too? Doesn't the homosexual deserve to be happy? Doesn't God forgive? No, the problem is it's a continual act, right? I mean, you got to stop it. You stop doing men with men working that which is unseemly. It's sin is what it's called in the Word of God. So you've got to stop it. It's the same with adultery. And you know, I, I preach that in all these Baptist churches that are pounding against uh, homosexuality. I say they are complete hypocrites. 
complete hypocrites that have ushered in new sins of sodomy in our age because they accepted the sin of adultery. They said, actually, according to the church, this one's okay. You know the preachers I've talked to who, who, who completely stomp on the Word of God on this topic, completely throw it away? Preachers I talk to, they'll say things frankly, well, what do you mean? I'd lose half my church. If I started preaching this the true way, I'd lose half my church. I had a missionary tell me that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I already lost. You're not telling the truth. Since when did a church's job become holding people over telling people the truth? It's always been telling people the truth. Good morning, good morning. We're just wrapping this up. Sorry, I, I'm long-winded. I always am. So by that logic, right, deserve to be happy. God forgives. Those arguments can be used for homosexual marriage as well. Where is happiness found, brethren, as we wind down? Where is happiness found, true happiness? And this is, I counsel people when they tell me they're stuck in this adulterous relationship, but they can't leave it because they have to be happy. Where is happiness found? We can go to a thousand verses that talk about this, but where? Yeah, in the Lord and in obeying His Word. No better happiness than getting on God's path for your life. I counsel people this. It's like, it just seems impossible. I'm going to lose everything, everything about my life, all the happiness I have. I said, friend, you don't know what happiness is until you get out of sin. You don't know what it is. And we, and now all the, the compromising Christians around these circles who say, well, don't they deserve to be happy? I mean, that's their whole life. Is that adulterous marriage that they're in? It's their whole life. Don't they deserve to have it? You know what all that proves to me is that people who say those things aren't right with God either. We've lost sight of what true happiness is. You know what it says in Romans 7, 3? It matches exactly what Christ said. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. That is present tense, as in she's continually committing adultery now, right? Even though she's married to another man, according to man's law, even though she has this other person called a husband, according to man's law, God says, you're not called a wife, you're called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, there's the solution. She is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. I'll share this verse with people. People will say including a sister who, I'm, who I love dearly, who now I, I don't interact with any longer, she'll say, there's no way I can argue with that. But it just sounds hard. Sounds hard. Since when did Christians dictate their lives by what they think sounds hard? That's what Christianity, Christianity is today. Is it a forgivable sin? The Bible says, Romans 6, 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Sure. If I cheated on my wife, heaven forbid, I could get forgiveness. But am I to continue to cheat on my wife that grace may abound? The Bible says, no. And that's what adultery is. Sanctioned cheating on your spouse. Okay, we're done. I'll just end with this thought, friends. You remind me, <laughs> it keeps going on and on because among Christian circles, you know what happens is Logan, um, Pastor Logan, brethren, is this really important enough to preach, right? Should we talk about it? There's just one of those little tiny little sins that don't really matter. I submit to you it's not at all. I also submit to you we have precedent in Scripture of people preaching on this topic of great significance, okay? Jesus Christ came and brought the message in the Gospels very clearly, Right? It means during his time on earth, he wanted people to understand that adultery was sin and continual sin. Divorce your marriage, right? Paul the Apostle gives us Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 7, to again reinforce this idea that divorce your marriage is sin. You see the end of this chapter? Or the, the end of 1 Corinthians 7, excuse me. He says marriage is until death. We have Jesus preaching the topic, Paul preaching the topic, and one of my favorites, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist preached this topic to who? King Herod. And John the Baptist walked up to King Herod and he says, it's not lawful for thee to have thy brother Philip's wife. John the Baptist one day needs to talk to Peter Ruckman because Peter Ruckman would have told him, John the Baptist, it's all forgiven. Or John the Baptist doesn't, uh, somebody else would say that John the Baptist didn't Herod have the right to be happy? 
No. John the Baptist knew the truth of the Word of God. John the Baptist lost his head over this issue. And John the Baptist did that, and that was the end of the great man who walked, the greatest man ever born of women. The end of his life was on this topic. And I believe it was meant to set a precedent that, yeah, the topic's going to be hard for Christians to preach. The world's not going to like it. In the year 2021, the churches aren't going to like it. It's going to be hard. But friends, we're not even going to lose our heads. All we're going to have are people say, you don't have any love if you're going to not allow sin. And then flip it on them and say, well, you believe the same thing about homosexuality, don't you? Well, let's not be hypocrites as Christians. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that um, the congregation is edified by sound doctrine, this idea of committing sin, Lord, continual sin. We know it's not for the Christian, Lord. We know we should um, confess and forsake our sin, as it tells us early in the book of 1 John. Lord, help Christians to do just that, and help us never believe any lies that a continual sin, such as adultery or anything else, is something forgiven under the blood that we can continue to partake in, Lord, because that is a massive lie from the pit of hell. I pray now, Lord, you'd bless our, our coming service, that you'd guide my lips, and Lord, um, guide our congregation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.